Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us um, for this panel discussion. This is part of a series of panels we are hosting to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Master of Medical Sciences and Global Health Delivery Program. So this program was launched in 2012 by Paul Farmer and Joy Mukherjee, who is our program director and other people in our department, the Harvard Medical School Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. And we are so excited this year to celebrate our 10th anniversary by hosting a series of panel discussions with alumni. So our alumni are across, working across the world doing amazing things. And it's just been wonderful to get a chance to hear more about their work and share that work with other people. I'll mention that the recordings of these events are on our website. And after this event, uh, we will send an email to everyone who registered with more information on the MMSCGHC program, our website. Um, if you're interested in applying to the program, there will be information about that. And then if you sign up on our email list, we'll send you reminders for our upcoming events. Our next event will be January 20th. Um, and that will be at 10 a.m. Eastern. So most of these are at 8 a.m. Eastern, but that will be at 10 a.m. Eastern, and that will be on the COVID-19 response. But today, I'm going to now turn this over to Joy Mukherjee, our program director. And again, thanks so much for joining us. Great. So welcome, everybody. And I'm always, always so happy to see our alumni on the the screen. Sometimes I get to see you all in person. Uh, welcome to Dr. Manami Uche, Theogen uh, Nigirishuti, and Dr. Anna Christina Sedas. They are all graduates of our program, who you'll hear from. Uh, the Global Health Delivery Master's Program really seeks to focus on how to uh, study and uh, implement and improve care to the world's most vulnerable people. And of course, among those people are migrants and refugees, often coming from fleeing violence, often, um, you know, people who are poor to begin with, and then fall out of the healthcare system in some way because of their uh, status. And so when we think about the right to healthcare, um, that is for everyone, even people who are not citizens, even people who are, uh, you know, fleeing violence. And so, um, you know, we, we're going to talk about that with these three wonderful uh, speakers. Dr. Uchi uh, graduated in 2020. Um, uh, Theogen Ingirishuti in graduated in 22. And uh, Anna Christina Sedas, uh, Dr. Anna Christina Sedas in uh, 21. So they're recent grads. They're very passionate about providing uh, health care for migrants and refugees. And they work on a variety of aspects of doing that, uh, whether it's food security, which is what Dr. Uche is working on, whether it's the infrastructural piece, which is what uh, Theogen in, in Jirishuti is working on, or whether it's the sort of legal and international framework as uh, Dr. Sedas is working on. So we're going to hear from them um, about the work they, they did. Um, and I believe we're going to start uh, with Theogen. So go ahead, Theogen. Thank you, Joya. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen just a second. Yes, we see we see your screen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, oh, do you want to go to so, presenter mode or you can click slide? There, now we see. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Joya. Um, it's a great pleasure being here and uh, to talk about uh, what I did uh, recently on my thesis. So uh, I got interested to do my research on refugee because I have been a refugee and I worked with uh, refugees. So I know by experience that refugees' human rights are uh, usually, if not always, uh, violated. And uh, as we know, at the beginning of the pandemic, countries were just focusing on themselves and uh, there wasn't enough 
advocacy for refugees while they were uh, disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And so given my experience and given uh, what I've been observing, I really believe that uh, to be a refugee is to be violated and that it is our duty and obligation to restore the dignity of refugees. And so uh, my research was really to explore the facilitators and barriers to COVID containment policies among citizens and refugees to be able to draw uh, some policy recommendations for future pandemic containment. And I did my research in, in Rwanda, in Islam-like areas and uh, in refugee camps. And as you can see, uh, the camps are really, uh, on, on, as you can see on the picture just here, uh, the camps are really overcrowded, overcrowded and the infrastructure is not appropriate to, for the implementation of the prevention uh, protocols and, uh, and, and the policies. To give uh, a background of the origin of refugees uh, in Africa, as we know, uh, the pre-colonial Africa did not have uh, boundaries. People moved freely and their movement were not uh, refugee movement as we know now. However, with uh, Berlin Conference, the European superpowers divided the continent amongst themselves and imposed borders. As a result, people uh, of different cultures and traditions were lumped together or people who share a lot in common were put in different countries. And these are factors prone to causing conflict and war as we, uh, as we see and hear in the Eastern part of Congo. And so the refugees, uh, the Congolese refugees I worked with fled their country because of uh, different wars, but mainly uh, the 1996 Congo war to remove Mobutu and uh, the 1998 uh, Great War, it was termed Great War because of so many people who were involved. And uh, um, others are still coming in Rwanda because of the uh, ongoing uh, conflict we know between the government and uh, the M23 uh, armed group. So it's really uh, absurd that a particular event, this Berlin conference, which happened in the interest of the colonial powers, that it is really still shaping uh, it has shaped the past of the continent and it is shaping the present of our continent, causing millions of deaths and thousands uh, to free their countries. So uh, we know Rwanda as a densely populated country with uh, a growing uh, per, uh, GDP per capita. And uh, the refugees that I worked with live in overcrowded environment, which is really very, uh, where it is really very difficult to control any outbreak. And so whenever I was working, uh, working in this uh, particular camp, I could see that controlling anyone from his uh, place where he lived was really very impossible and controlling any disease could be very, very difficult. Uh, and so I, in my research, I interviewed uh, uh, 48 people and carried out uh, four focus group discussions with people who have recovered from COVID or people who have uh, lost a close family member to COVID or people who were uh, actively involved in the management of COVID to ensure that uh, I really capture the rich experiences of uh, different uh, uh, research participants. And so in our research, we found out that COVID containment was facilitated by uh, a number of things, 
but one of them was really uh, vaccine equity, where Rwanda, no one was discriminated against regardless of their citizenship. So being a refugee was not a factor for uh, being discriminated. And uh, uh, other factor included uh, responsible citizenship, which really involved owning uh, the preventative measures and uh, whether being a citizen or a refugee, always reminding each other to abide by the protocols. And then um, the role of uh, leadership, which was really central in terms of providing social support and uh, coordinating um, containment efforts. With regard to barriers, uh, we found that poverty was one of the most um, uh, significant factor, given that uh, the poor were not able to uh, abide by the protocols. And then we find in the camps that uh, the environment is really very uh, crowded. And so it's impossible to um, implement the preventative measures. Then we had the, uh, some dose of uh, COVID denialism, people who never believed and, or accepted that COVID was really uh, a reality. And then um, the fact that the uh, COVID-19 vaccines had um, foreign origin. So, Against uh, my assumptions at the beginning that refugees would really suffer disproportionately, I found out that uh, in the case of Rwanda, they were not discriminated uh, based on their citizenship. However, this happened because uh, there had been some kind of preconditions. Um, there were these uh, pre-existing inclusive conditions some of which we do not find in other countries. And refugees in those other countries really had to uh, serve at the West in this uh, particular period of uh, the pandemic. And so uh, I believe that inclusion beyond citizenship is really key to promoting the health of refugees and uh, migrants. However, despite that, we found uh, this kind of inclusivity and no discrimination in Rwanda. We also found that uh, the most vulnerable among citizens were exposed to extra social and economic uh, hazards. And uh, this really uh, was an indication that no good policy is good for everyone and that we need always go back and see who we are leaving behind. And I believe this is the core for, uh, for equity. So to promote, uh, uh, to control the pandemic in Rwanda, different factors were uh, involved. Uh, but as way of conclusion, probably uh, introduction to our discussion, uh, if we want to promote the health of refugees and citizens um, in this particular environment, I believe that it is very important that we create uh, egalitarian policy foundations in order to form uh, resilient and equitable and unified communities that will be able to handle uh, different crises. And then I believe that it is very important to prioritize uh, and increase social support for the vulnerable so that uh, they don't miss out on any effect on, or any outcome of good, uh, of good policies so that no one is really left behind. And lastly, I believe that uh, we really need to invest in local solutions. Uh, and here I'm mainly focusing on um, investing in vaccine manufacturing to ensure that uh, uh, we have enough of the vaccine that we want or enough of other uh, medicine that we, we, we want. And when uh, I really say local, I really mean uh, investing in, um, in Africa, investing in vaccine manufacturing in Africa 
where this product will be very proximal to the people who need it. I will pause from here and then uh, wait for further discussion. Thank you. Oops, Trey, you're muted. Thank you so much, Thanos. That was great. And I think, you know, this is the, the kind of study and then implementation work that is needed. Um, I know you're, um, you know, you were very keen to see what the experiences were of the of the refugees. And in fact, they did have the access to health care and yet they have other struggles. So, you know, these are really important things to document, but, you know, really kudos to the government uh, of Rwanda for, for trying to equalize the access to the vaccine. And, you know, obviously there's so much work to do uh, with all vulnerable people. So thank you for that. Um, I think we're gonna move now to uh, Dr. Manami Uche, who is uh, talking uh, about the work that she's done around the world, but her particular interest being food security and the impact of nutritional um, support at, or the lack of nutritional support on people who uh, are displaced. So, um, so go ahead, Manami. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joy. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Um, thank you so much, Joya, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thanks also to Christina and Bailey for organizing this wonderful opportunity to virtually gather today. Um, so today I will briefly share some of the uh, learning experiences I had um, while studying at Harvard and also my insights into the health of refugees, migrants, and uh, other displaced populations in the world based on my work in the past, uh, working with these groups of people who live in extraordinarily uh, challenging circumstances. Uh, so I, I, before I begin, I just wanted to note that my presentation will include uh, the theme of violence, namely uh, structural and, and different forms of structural and, and direct violence. And I will not show any um, violent images or visual images, um, but I just, I'm aware that people do have uh, various different um, lived experiences and words. Um, we know that sometimes words are powerful enough to impact us in profound ways. So I just wanted to give a heads up. So uh, as for my master's thesis, my field work and research uh, took place in the Northern Navajo Nation and my research explored the long-term effect impacts of the fresh pr produce prescription program on the childhood obesity in the Indian nation. And because my, as Joya said, um, because my um, background is in nutrition and medicine, my academic interests have long been at the intersection of food insecurity, uh, nutrition, malnutrition, and marginalization, um, and health disparities, uh, particularly uh, among indigenous people and other vulnerable uh, populations, including refugees um, and asylum seekers, etc. So this is a map. Uh, Navajo Nation is the largest. Uh, I'm sorry to cut in. Um, I don't. We're not seeing your slides. Can you share your slide? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Did I share? Yes, not yet. please. Oh, you didn't share yet. Please. Oh, share. sorry. That's it's okay. Why. Is it? it oh, yes. do you see it? Now we yep, see it. There it yes. is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's so put on presentation was... mode. Great, sorry about that. Um, it's okay. So that was my first um, oh. first slide, second, and this was the map. Uh, Navajo Nation is the largest Indian nation in the in the United States, and it's located in the um, uh, four corners of the American Southwest. And if you've ever been a student at the HMS Department of Global Health and Social Medicine you know that you cannot graduate without learning the importance of applying uh, insights from um, anthropology, ethnography, uh, history, sociology, and political economy um, to develop a transformative approach um, to the most urgent global uh, problems in global health. 
And so for me, uh, learning uh, the history of Navajo Nation, uh, as well as the ind indigenous history of peoples in America was absolutely a necessary process for me to, um, to better understand the disproportionately uh, high rates of poverty and food insecure households and um, aler the alarmingly high prevalence of nutrition related uh, non-communicable diseases, both in adults and children um, in Navajo Nation. So until the 1800s, um, the Diné people, um, Navajo people in, in their na native language, they are called Diné, and they uh, sustain themselves by acquiring food through a mixture of uh, hunting, gathering, farming, and herding. And then the U.S. colonizers, American settlers, uh, entered and invaded their native lands, and the U.S. conquest and the genocide of indigenous people began under the name of uh, the premise of the Manifest Destiny. And one of the most notable and tragic events in the very long history of Navajo Nation is uh, well, the um, also commonly known as the Long Walk, uh, which took place in 1864. And this was uh, when the U.S. Army rounded up um, the surviving 8,000 Diné people who were captured and tortured. And they were marched um, for 300 miles. And then if they survived the, the Long Walk, they were imprisoned and in the military concentration camp uh, in Fort, uh, Fort Sumner, New Mexico. And because of the high alkali content of the soil in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, uh, no food plants could be adequately uh, farmed and cultivated um, on the site of incarceration. And as a result, um, thousands of thousands of DNA died due to starvation and diseases, um, many infectious diseases uh, during for long, four long uh, years of inhuman uh, torture and incarceration. So uh, you may be wondering why I'm talking about the history of indigenous people today. Um, the, the first part of my master's thesis opens with a discussion of the Dine history of the race nation. And I remember during one of the very first meetings with Julia, uh, shortly after I first arrived in Boston, uh, we discussed what the uh, race nation knew in the context of the indigenous people's uh, history. And it really uh, helped me broaden my intellectual curiosity and also the way um, helped develop the way I approach my uh, research analysis. And the word deracinate uh, originates from a late 16th century French word and the means uh, just like in English uh, means removal. And the <laughs> latter part derives from the Latin radix, uh, which means root in, in English. So to deracinate uh, means to uproot. And to deracinate indigenous people means uh, to physically remove or separate them from their native land. But not only that, it specifically means uh, to disconnect them from their traditional identities, culture, and belief system, and any other racial or ethnic uh, characteristics or influences. And of course, uh, not all refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons um, and migrants are uh, indigenous people. However, um, indigenous peoples remain the most marginalized and vulnerable group uh, in many societies throughout the world. And therefore they are prone to become refugees and asylum seekers and, and, um, and often forcibly displayed for various reasons. And this, the, the concept of the race nation, I believe, is really important aspect when we approach healthcare for refugees and other uh, displaced people in the world. Um, just like plants and other living uh, beings, human require, we humans require adequate water, uh, light, nutritious food, and, and balanced diet and also safe and uh, comfortable environment in order not just to survive, but to thrive. And a basic needs for healthy growth and development must be satisfied for human flourishing. 
And um, in my first year at Harvard, I had the privilege of joining the group of graduate students across Harvard uh, to, and took a course entitled Narratives of Belonging and Displacement in Israel and the West Bank. This is a course uh, led by incredible professors and scholars such as Diane Moore at the Harvard uh, Divinity School and the Marshall Gantz. Um, and um, on the left, I on the picture, I am replanting an olive tree in the barren desert of the occupied Palestinian territory. And in Palestine, olive trees have been uh, literally and figuratively um, the symbol of their life and livelihood and cultural identity for uh, thousands of years. So for Palestinian people, uh, replanting olive trees is an act of resistance and, um, and continuation of anti-colonial struggles. And also it is um, act of regaining sovereignty while cultivating their new life and um, seeding their future. And how do people become displaced from their native land? Um, there are many, many factors and reasons involved, um, but in most cases, as uh, most of you know, uh, they are uprooted from their homeland uh, because of various forms of violence. And in the context of indigenous history and today's food insecurity and, and health disparities and inequity, I am in my thesis, I draw upon a, um, nutritional colonialism uh, as an example of cultural uh, structural and ultimately uh, direct violence um, against indigenous people. And these uh, these um, terms of violence, different kinds of violences are, um, are studied and, and discussed by the scholar uh, Johann Galton. And according to Johann Galton, uh, violence can be understood as avoidable insults to um, to basic human needs, and violence is needs deprivation. And of course, uh, many of you are familiar with the social theories our dear uh, teacher Paul Farmer taught us, and also as Professor Arthur Kleiman teaches us, um, the sufferings uh, caused by violence are often inherently um, interpersonal and um, also intergenerational, especially in cases of refugees, asylum seekers, uh, migrants, and other forcibly displaced people. So all of us, uh, regardless of who we are and where we come from, we all have these levels of needs that must be met and uh, satisfied in order to thrive and flourish. And when these needs, survival needs, well-being needs, identity needs, freedom needs, um, these, when these needs are deprived and insulted um, and human rights uh, are infringed upon, uh, we experience violence. And Galton also argues that the uh, uh, opposite of violence then is uh, peace. And But we have to remember that peace is not simply uh, the absence of war and conflicts, but um, peace is uh, the presence of um, absence of dire poverty and hunger, discrimination anywhere and everywhere. And, and also peace is, for example, safe housing. Peace is an um, equitable employment uh, and quality education and healthcare. And people, uh, peace is where displaced and persecuted people are protected and supported and encouraged to live for the future uh, despite their um, unimaginably difficult life circumstances. And, and peace is, of course, the presence of uh, social justice. So, for so healthcare for refugees, um, migrants, and all displaced population is not only delivering. Um, medical care uh, or administering medicine or treating injuries or um, alleviating hunger or 
providing shelters, but um, their health encompasses the system to help support um, every level of their needs. So I believe we all have uh, roles to play in advancing health and well-being of the most vulnerable population in the world because um, peace is the antidote to violence and which continue to affect too many people in the world. So these are my references with that. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Minami. I think, you know, what's interesting when we think about the populations you've discussed, um, your own experience mm -hmm. uh, as an Okinawan, which we've talked about, and then the Diné mm -hmm. people and the Palestinian people, these are not migrants. Um, and in many ways, they're not refugees. Uh, they're occupied peoples. And I think that is really a, a an important aspect of what we're talking about is the people who have for you know whatever reason often a political reason structural violence um they have become refugees in their own land essentially and so um you know really appreciate those comments and you know we've talked a lot about that word deracination a word i find very important in thinking about global health because when you rob people of identity of homeland um you know of culture it's uh, you know it it results in a lot of illnesses um that so it is really one of these social determinants of health is i think how removed people are from their their sense of community and, and culture and well-being. So um, we're, we'll move to Dr. Sedas now. Anna, Chris, you've been so passionate about this uh, work um, in your home country of Mexico, but around the world. So why don't you share with us your thinking? Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Um, I also wanted to compliment the work that Theo and Manami have been doing. Um, my my work, something that is different from what I will present is that I unfortunately didn't have an opportunity to do my thesis in the field given the pandemic. So I, I did have that opportunity to to weave in what we saw um, within our courses and and just dive deep into what is migration and health? What is it that we are studying? Um, and, and what is the field to understand a bit of different perspectives? So I hope that what I am about to present uh, really reflects the hard work uh, that, that Theo and Manami have been conducted in the field to complement from a, a more of a global perspective. Um, so I will we'll just start um, sharing my screen here and let me know if you're able to see it. Um, so I will start presenting um, a biosocial analysis of uh, migration and health. I am just going to start a quick timer because I know myself um, and I think it's important to, to allow some time to, to speak. Um, so first I would like to uh, thank the opportunity for, for uh, allowing me to speak today. I, I, I think that, um, having or, or working at a global level sometimes um, takes us away from the from the ground and it has been very humbling to to listen to um, alumni um, and the work that they're doing uh, in the field and then seeing it from a global perspective and I just want to thank also and, and reflect from my thesis committee that this is a reflection of the work uh, that we did as well as the MMSC program uh, and GHDI that really weaved in everything that I learned and gave it words and meaning uh, into what I'm doing. Um, so despite being on the move for over 200,000 years, the right to access healthcare in a continuous form remains a challenge. Um, we, we saw through the experience of Theo and Manami that access to healthcare is not something that is given despite being a human right. It is something that in a way as a migrant, it has to be earned by hard labor, by displacement, by war, by something that puts you in a, in a difficult situation. But it's not that, it's a human right that everyone is born with. So when, when discussing what is migration and health, we go and we dive deep into what has been the current response of COVID-19 
and something that we discovered during COVID-19 is that an individual, everyone is a potential refugee and migrant. Everyone here has the potential of going through this extreme experience or even this unfortunate um, or fortunate experience that changes their health outcomes. And this is what I will be discussing in a little bit. So during our program, we discussed a lot that on the social determinants of health. Something that I would really like to talk is how migration while I was in the program, it, it became seen in my mental framework. And then I started to continuously see in the literature that migration itself is a social determinant of health. So according to the World Health Organization, so the, the social determinants are non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. So there are conditions in which people are born, they grow, they work, they live, and they age within. And there are a set of forces and systems that shape conditions of the daily life. These forces and systems either improve health outcomes or diminish health outcomes. If we think of that, migration itself is a social determinant of health. The act of migration alleviates or improves in a way their health outcomes, or at the same time, it could increase their risk of not having the other social determinants that really improve health outcomes. So as a statement, migration and health is, uh, sorry, migration is a social determinant of health by itself. It's bi-directional because it's socially caused, but it also alleviates all of the other challenges. Um, it is the result of cumulative exposure to structural political social conditions that alleviate or uh, that improve or, or um, sorry, that I just saw on my watch. Uh, cumulative exposure to structural social political uh, that could alleviate the conditions. But it's also historical, it's social, it's economical, it's geographical, it's structural, it's political as we, as we saw with the history of African movement. It, it has a lot to do with the conditions in origin countries. It has everything to do with previous and current health seeking experiences. It is cumulative if we look at it as a life course perspective. It, it, it affects the access and the continuity while in the country of origin and movement and return and forced return and voluntary return. Um, and it's also the working, the living, the social and the environmental conditions in transit and hosts. So when we look at this, we're only looking at the lens of public health policies and migration policies. But when we really do explore what is migration and health, we realize that this is a multidimensional, multi-layered and a dynamic experience. So when we're producing, in a way, policies, global policies, programs, um, events, webinars, we have to think that we are talking about one single person. Are we talking about one single community? Are we talking about one historical event that leads to a series of events that leads to the person that I met while I was doing my master's program? And this is the perspective that uh, I was able to gather during my master's program. So I want to discuss a little bit of why, what is it that I'm doing? I, I've questioned this so many times and why am I doing this? Why am I fighting for access to healthcare for refugees and migrants when not even locals have access to healthcare? And there are two reasons. Reason number one is that I or you or anyone that we know are potential refugees and migrants. We saw how war broke in, in Ukraine. We've seen how displacement in Africa has been chronic. We know right now that how the situation in Haiti is worsening and worsening and worsening. And we know the history of Haiti. Why am I fighting for access to health care for refugees and migrants if locals don't even have access to that? It's because if we build a system that really helps the world most vulnerable, everyone, every single person. We build a system that helps all. So now I, I want to just talk a little bit about some very key uh, words or very key themes that, that embed and weave um, and, and help us with the understanding and framing of why health and migration. I'm, I'm gonna go quickly through here because I would like to discuss a, a case study and I have three minutes and 34 seconds. Joya, you would be proud of myself. 
So syndemic, we heard this a lot, two or more conditions that coexist, interaction between the social poverty, discrimination, chronic stress, structural violence. This was also mentioned in, in Manami's talk, and how is all of that related to the health of an individual? Um, then we talked about the syndemic vulnerability, the overlapping burden of disease, aggravated adversity, that's in a way synergically, uh, they, they affect the structural and political adversity, and that was discussed by Theo. Um, we have the structural vulnerability and how a class-based economic exploitation in increases the cultural uh, sorry, increased by cultural, gender, sexual, racialized discrimination, they increase the risk of preventable harm, illness, and death. And we now talk about structural violence. This, all of this is embedded within our institutions, the ones we work with, the ones we work for, the ones we, we are part of. We are part of that structural violence. Structural because it's embedded within society and it's violent because it harms people. And we need to be aware of this because we are part of the policies. We're part of the movements. We're part of the research that creates change and advances policies to protect, respect, and fulfill the right to health of all people that are reflected in all of our work. So um, I just want to go quickly and, and highlight several very main characteristic points of view. This is a telegram found in 19, uh, 1819, I think, um, and, and, it's, and it's how we frame migrants. There's a telegram saying dirty, hundreds of dirty, lousy, destitute Mexican migrants. They're bringing in diseases, blah, blah, blah. And let's call on quarantine. And after this, there was this monumental experience of human rights, the first recognition that all people, all people had rights. They had the right to access health care. However, migrants were not explicitly included. What does it take to explicitly include refugees and migrants? And that's my daily struggle. And then they're like 1966, okay, so you know, migrants have access to health care, but it wasn't explicitly included. Then it was included in the general comment act. They, they kind of clarified it, okay, you know, migrants too, because of the MDGs, because if you have people, your machinery, if they're healthy, they will produce a healthy economy. And then they shift to that with the SDGs. And now migration is part in cross-cutting across 15 SDGs, but only mentioned once. And only mentioned in the root causes of migration, but it does not take into account the structural, the political, the geographical forces that drive migration. And migration is a bi-directional determinant of health. And we also have it embedded within global compacts and compromise. So despite all of this happening, why is it that access to healthcare remains a conversation? Why is it that we're investing all of our energy in providing the basic right to access healthcare? So what is the difference between this and this? What has changed after 75 years? We still have the same narrative. Migrants are a problem to be dealt with rather than migrants are people. We continue to other an individual that could be ourselves, that could be our family. So going back here um, to statistics, that people are not statistics. I'm, eh, I'm gonna wrap up here quickly. So people are not statistics. And this is something that was very important to understand within our master program, is that they showed us how to transform statistics into people to understand that, that the case of Avelino is the reflection of all of these numbers accumulated, that Avelino is not one of 50,000. Avelino is a unique story. And the reflection of the pandemic and what happened is, is the reflection of all of the accumulated stories. There's one word that I would like to, for you to keep in mind. And it's funny that I'm mentioning this, but it's called sonder. Sonder is the word that englobes the realization that everyone, a passerby, is experiencing a life as complex as your own. And when you realize that, when you realize that one of those statistics is a person, you realize that you need to fight for that person. And that th there are 50,000 people monthly experiencing that. And I'm just going to swiftly go through the case of Avelino. Um, if I have time, please, Joya, Christina, please do interrupt me. I'm passionate, so I already know that my time's up. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna push some buttons here to see if I have some time. So if I have a green light- Yeah, if you continue. do it quickly. Uh, uh, yeah, Anna. sounds good. Yeah. 
So um, my thesis ended up being this. So I, I took all the information I knew. I used my ADHD superpowers and I just read everything. Mm -hmm. And then the master's program really gave some structure into what I was understanding and learning. So this is the case of Avelino. So Avelino, Avelino was, uh, uh, this is a case study that I, I found for Partners in Health um, uh, in Sister Organization in Mexico. And they, they discussed the story of this individual, Avelino, that was, um, is, I hope he still is, um, a Guatemalan individual that, that was forced to migrate to Mexico. So after Avelino's death of, of his family, he was left alone. He had no access to social or health protection. Avelino, when he was 14 in 2002, he became part of the 32% of children in Guatemala that had not completed primary school and was forced uh, to work the lands of the haciendarios. That's where we go back to colonial history. By the age of 20, one point, uh, Avelino became part of the 1.4 million international migrants, that labor migrants that had to go between Guatemala and Mexico. By the age of, uh, by the age I think of in 2015, he became part of that 13.10% of remittance that we that Guatemala received in, in that same year. So Avelino's life was to provide direct money to increase the GDP. So therefore, if Avelino's healthy, our remittance increased. <laughs> However, by the age of 20, I can't see because of, of the of the slides, but Avelino contributed to uh, majorly to, to the economy. So what happens to Avelino? Avelino got sick. He had been sick for a very long time. He had a cough and it's a normal cough. You know, it's okay to cough and it is structural and it is an everyday's violence that he had normalized his cough. He had no money. He had no opportunity to change his situation and he had to work. So Avelino really tried to access healthcare. He had to travel for eight hours to, to go to a clinic. He had no money. He had to pay out of pocket expense despite having free access to healthcare in a country in Mexico. He had no access to labs. He had no social networks and he really didn't know what was going on. He heard something about the pandemic and, and he didn't wanna to go to a hospital. They said people were killed in the hospital and I did not want to die. So Avelino, despite all of the barriers, he continued to try to approach healthcare, but the, the system was not prepared to receive an individual that has so much history behind. And that's when uh, Avelino met partners in health. Avelino was super sick. He was in bed and he, he knew that he was going to die. And at that moment, he saw a passerby that ended up being a pasante from Compañeros en Salud Mexico. And at that moment, Avelino was taken immediately to access healthcare in a hospital in, in Jaltenango. Marta Rieta, uh, an alumni that also took this program, she said, whatever it was, it can't be COVID. We, we don't know a lot about COVID, but this ain't COVID. This prison has been coughing for a long time. They, they were not, they didn't have access to any sort of testing other than a chest X-ray, and they found out that he had tuberculosis. However, there was no access to medication. Um, fortunately enough for Avelino, but unfortunately for another person, Avelino was able to receive the medication from another person that was lost to follow up. And therefore Avelino um, was, was cured for tuberculosis after six months of treatment. So um, just to go quickly, this is something that we contextualize. Numbers are numbers, people are people. But when we bring it together, we understand why people matter and, and why, as Paul Farmer said, that the, if someone chooses who lives and who dies, that is the problem that has, the world has. Um, so Avelino's story is, is a unique story and not because he, he is a migrant from Guatemala, it's because he was seen. He was an outlier and not because he had undiagnosed TB, but because he was able to actually receive care in Mexico. And to finalize, I just want to bring forward this quote that it gave me chills when I read it. First, they came for the communist and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialist and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. 
Then they came from the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. But then they came from me, and there was no one left to speak for me. We need to speak up for migrants because one day there will be no one left to speak out for them. And this is the work that we're doing, and this is this is the the the, the I'm going to cry. This is this is the master's program. It gives people rather than numbers. So thank you so much, and looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Anna, Chris. Um, so uh, really fantastic work from from everybody. Um, you know. Uh, there is a, a request for just sending some uh, articles and books, uh, recommendations, uh, and you know, uh, so we can we can do that. We have definitely uh, you know books and articles to read more about healthcare among migrants, among displaced people, among colonized people. Um, so there's two questions, um, and I, I'll start with. Um, you know, you, Manami, one, uh, and, the, and you all can answer, but uh, where, where do you think we should move as academics to focus on peace? Uh, I think that's, you, and you brought up peace, and um, I think that's a great question. How do we, as academics, take that on? Okay. Am I unmuted? Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. That is a really difficult question, I guess. Um, can, is there a place I can read or no? That's the question. Oh, it's um, in the you know, if you look in the questions, um, so if you see Q&A at the bottom. Yeah. The Q and A, it's over in the Q and A. It's the bottom question, and I'm just kind of summarizing it, uh, Manami. So and we oh, don't have okay, a lot of time. Okay. okay. So really, just you know, Personal where reasons. do you think we start as mm -hmm. global health people to move toward peace? Like, what are what are some elements of how you think framing the work around peace? Yeah, I think. Um... Having worked um, for asylum seekers on uh, the past few years and, and also refugees, and I think it really goes back to the core concept that we learn uh, uh, in the program, our master's program, that uh, really health is, um, as, I, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, health is not just um, medical care, right? Um, we, learn, we learn from Paul Farmer that uh, we need five S's everywhere, no matter uh, where people are. And say what um, where those they are, are, not me. Five <laughs> S's are yeah. five uh, staff, stuff, space, systems, and support. And as I was uh, making uh, today's, uh, preparing today's presentation, I really thought about that. Like, yeah, like really, yes, we are um, talking about refugees and the most vulnerable people who are in a very, uh, special circumstances, but uh, when it comes down to that, like really, when, when we think about our needs, what makes us healthy and happy and 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 find meanings in our lives, uh, the same goes to uh, people we serve, right? And as Anna said, Anna Chris said that too, and so. Um, I think it's really important to focus on social medicine aspect of in, in clinical spaces as well. And um, um, really um, like housing is health, um, transportation is health, right? Um, communication to the people need our health. So everything, um, so I think we as healthcare professionals really have to, um, um, work together to build the uh, um, system and infrastructures and, and collaborate together. We can't do it alone, but um, Joya, you always tell, teach us that, that we have to work together with people who share visions and, and the same goals. And um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. No, that's, but. I think that's a great point, Manami, that's that, um, you know, because I think one of the aspects that you bring up with the five S's is that there is a material resourcing 
of peace. Mm -hmm. You can't just talk about peace. And I, I think this is what we're seeing with, with a lot of the gang violence and other things in Haiti right. when unemployment is 80%, when people don't have basic food security, when, you know, I mean, so there right. is a material resourcing of peace mm -hmm. and a material resourcing of support for migrants. And maybe I'll turn it to you, Theo. Um, you know, when you think about what you saw in Rwanda in terms of people getting access to care, how what did you how did you think the government was doing that? How was how was um, you know how was the thinking about that uh, that you sort of experienced? Thank you, Drea, and uh, thank you everyone for this wonderful uh, space. Um, so maybe to first of all uh, start with the question uh, of where do we start to really uh, talk about peace for every everybody? Uh, in the context of uh, let, let me start with the context of Africa, um, and uh, I, I find that the history is really embedded with. Um, a lot of factors that are leading to wars and conflicts and uh, you know and violence and so on and so um i think we we didn't need to re-evaluate our history and be able to shape uh, a future that we we want um for instance the main cause of conflicts and these uh, refugee movements is linked to the berlin conference which shaped Africa in ways that were not really in the interest of African people. Mm -hmm. And so now that we, uh, we, we are experiencing wars in the Eastern part of Congo, th these wars are linked to that. And uh, how can we, uh, how can we shape that? How, what can we do to make sure that these borders between countries, the borders that are becoming the reason why we have refugees actually become redundant and have no, uh, no, no impact. Um, I was speaking with a few people and we were like, uh, we have never heard of a Belgian refugee in France, <laughs> but we are always hearing of Congolese refugees in Rwanda and we are both neighbors. So uh, how can we make sure that these borders are not really uh, 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 a dividing factor, but rather an opportunity for us to grow together and source peace. This will be in, yeah. in, in evaluating our history. Now, Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I can get excited then. <laughs> I know, but it's great. And we'll we'll go to Anna Chris quickly, and then we're going to have to wrap up. So maybe I'll cut you off there, Theo. I mean, I think that's right. Thank you go back to history. You can't understand where we are. So I would say the question to all scholars, right, is you can't understand today without understanding where we, we were. And so there is a reparatory strategy that we have to think about, whether it's reparations per se with a capital R or some reparatory strategy. And one of the things I think is happened, at least with this situation in Rwanda is, the idea that we, you know, we are all brothers, we share a common language, we share a common history. And so, you know, we're going to extend our health insurance system to you. So I think, um, you know, that that fellowship uh, is also, you know, acknowledging the shared history. Um, Anna, Chris, you want to just say something about that for the Guatemala-Mexico divide and, um, you know, which you were studying with Avelino's case. Yeah, um, I, I, I also found a lot of, um, so first, thank you for, for this, and Theo, if, if you have, if you want to complete your idea, I'm happy to give you my time because I took more time from, from the rest of the people. So I just wanted to mention that if, if, you, if you want to complete your idea. Go ahead, please, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. so I, I, I wanted to uh, comment on that. So there's this question of, do we have this moral obligation? Is there a moral obligation as countries to provide healthcare? For instance, in the case of Mexico and Guatemala, 
or if we go back to the entire history of foreign interventions in Central America, what is the U.S. moral obligation to uh, providing health care to refugees and migrants that were actually the, the, the result of years of foreign interventions, going back to uh, the point from, from Theo. So in a way, if, if I look at it at this global perspective, from I'm gonna go global, regional, and then local. So at a global perspective, there's not an obligation, there's actually a written document and a signed agreement that the countries and regions that are, are state members are, are going to provide access to healthcare because people are uh, have rights, but mostly because there's this target that we need to achieve by the year 2030, which is cross-cutting and migration is cross-cutting. So that's one sense, you know? So that when we read all of the policies documents, like, oh, you know, well, in line with the X document, in line with X document. So in theory, it's, it's, it, it is going to happen. In theory, a person has access to healthcare because of that transition. Um, we see, for instance, the situation in, in Europe with the war um, that immediately Ukrainians were inserted within the healthcare system. But we saw how there was an exclusion of, or the othering of the other refugees and migrants. We saw that, you know, if you were, there were double or triple refugees. You had Syrian refugees in, or, or refugees from Syria in Ukraine then they were now trying to be refugees in Romania and, and, and separate systems were created. We see that in the US-Mexico border with separate systems that are being created. So that's at a global level. Who gets to choose who lives and who dies, who has access to healthcare and who doesn't. So at a global level, in theory, everyone has um, not this moral obligation, but this, this agreement that is signed. Now, at a regional level, dynamics are different, funding is different, and needs are, in a way, put together and said, all people need this. So let's create a vertical program and then just perhaps just focus on vertical approaches, either biomedical, and we saw it with COVID-19 vaccines. There was a lot of advocacy for access to COVID-19 vaccines for migrants in X, Y, and Z place. And the, but or social interventions. So let's just give all the money to wash. And then you had billions of dollars in, in, in hand and sanitizing uh, experiences. So we, we saw how regional approaches are. But now we see in at a country level when things are extremely competitive, where there's the socialization of scarcity, when we are forced to say, okay, we only have, uh, we, we only have this medication. Abelino needs this medication. He's a Guatemalan migrant, but we're not looking at his status at this moment because we have medication available that will expire and this person has access to this right now. But this other person missed this medication and that means that this other person will die of tuberculosis. Avelino lived because he had someone else's dose. Avelino did not live because there was health equity. And this is something that as academia, as researchers, as people that work within NGOs, we have to bring forward to those regional and global platforms because those are not being reflected in policies. We're not continuously, there's this migration blindness and it's not articulated across. I'll stop. Thanks. Yeah, um, thank you. I was and I, I, am, I am very sorry that I have no, to no, no, go ahead. If there is some more discussion to be had, we have this space for another half an hour. So please stay and chat and Christina is happy to uh, support that. I, I apologize for having to leave. I have some visitors here, so I have okay. to attend to them, but thank you thank all. Yeah, thank you so much, Joya. Great to see you guys. Thank you, Joya. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So yes, we can continue. Um, and uh, sorry, Chris, I know Joya just wanted to jump in. And no, 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 no. This is a great go. exercise. This is a, yeah. an amazing exercise to control my response. So yes, no, so I do see one other question. I see um, some thank yous in the Q&A. Um, 
And then uh, thank you for this insightful event. Um, and then I do see one, one other question in, um, about um, so what innovations in your experience have been proven in sourcing for equipment, medications, and services for the migrant and refugee populations? And I know, you know, um, uh, you folks are recent alumni of our program, so uh, so I realize this may be a question kind of for, that we should come back and ask you in a few more years after you have some more um, experience. But if you have thoughts on that question, what uh, you know, what treatment or innovations have proven to be effective um, in resource in getting resources to these to to migrants and refugees? Do you do you folks have thoughts on that, or maybe you've witnessed what you've witnessed? So far, Let's Christina, could you repeat the question? Sorry, I, I was answering. Um, in a That's chat okay. Box. So here it's um it's uh so this person is it says I find it very difficult to get funding or resources for migrants um from both the government sectors and public sectors, um so because there's often preferential treatment for citizens and of course we saw Rwanda's different um we saw that case um. And so where would you suggest we seek funding or support for healthcare and pursuit of treatment or what innovations in your experience have proven to be very effective in sourcing for equipment, medications and services for migrant and refugee populations? That's the full question. <laughs> so if, if, if I could add some information at a, a global regional level. So um, you're absolutely right. Um, I don't know the name of the person that... Pat, um, Pat. Ah, uh, Pat. Um, so, Pat, you're absolutely right. There is, there's not a lot of funding. Why? Because there's, it, it costs money, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, there, there, there are national budgets for accounting for X in the amount of people, and that was one of the points that migration policies don't consider the health of migrants, and health policies don't consider that that there will be an increase in population. In in in, in fact, in 2050. We, we will increase the, the global population movement uh, exponentially. So there's systems are not prepared for that. So uh, staff safe space system. So unfortunately that's one point, um, but there are some resources um, specifically, for instance, if you're looking at population in, unfortunately the money is in Europe. So follow the money, where, the, where, where is the money? A lot of funding that I've seen is uh, from European centers that are conducting research that specifically support uh, refugees and migrants in other regions because of their alliance with member states, et cetera. Um, so I would, for instance, I know that NIH has some funding. I know that Germany as, as a member state also has some funding uh, in terms of that. Now for service, for actual services delivery or service delivery, I do not know specifically, perhaps my colleagues could, could answer that. Um, but I do know that if you link it with research, it's easier um, to be able to, to have a grant and link it with health delivery, that's one. And two, if you link this, this health delivery and how this support improves the life of people, you're able to embed within the health delivery strategy, uh, a way of evaluating how and what is the impact because funders really need that they need impact they need numbers they need um accounts so i would highly encourage to think about this hybrid yes they give you material they give you funding for material you produce research with that you deliver care directly to people which is something that we do uh in theo manami where i could be able to discuss that but you could also create evidence and generate evidence to advocate towards more funding, towards more inclusion. That I, if I could help in that perspective um, at a global regional level, um, but I'm sure that my colleagues have, have very like much more insightful information to share. Thank you, Nova. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, I was actually thinking that, uh, money is not the problem, money is not the major problem, because I believe that the major problem is the lack of uh, creativity, the lack of initiative for, from different uh, leaders, and the lack of political will to, uh, to integrate refugees within the existing system. 
So uh, if uh, people really advocate, strongly advocate for the integration of these refugees and migrants within the, uh, their health system, their local health systems, then where the money comes from for, for, for the local people, then that will be the source for uh, the money to source the medication and uh, equipments for refugees. They will benefit from the, 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 the local system. And uh, I believe that uh, if the emphasis uh, becomes to go and source the money, you know, laterally, source money laterally from uh, uh, different countries, just trying, <laughs> I'm going, aside what Christina was suggesting, that would not necessarily uh, solve the, the problem, but rather ensuring that uh, we uh, leaders, or we as leaders, we develop that kind of will and desire to integrate refugees within our own system, then we'll be able to provide for their needs. Otherwise, there will always be that level of dependency and uh, we have only um, um, seasonal changes rather than having a kind of uh, sustainable solution to, to the problem. I, I'm not sure if I responded to your question, but I feel like that's the direction that we, we should go. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, Manami, do you want to answer this or, as well? or? Yeah, I, I just, um, I, I completely agree with Theo. Uh, I think uh, oftentimes local uh, communities, uh, there are people uh, who are very passionate um, and activism and, um, and grassroots movement. Um, so in terms of uh, the size of resources and funding that might be uh, limited and not as uh, as great as um, the things that, for instance, the government can provide. But um, once again, like Theo said, um, as long as there is a will, there are ways to uh, move things forward. And so um, finding uh, groups of people who uh, share common visions and goals uh, in your community and, and working um, from, you know, bottom top and then, you know, collaborating, and that might be a great place to start. And and also some uh, sometimes, I, I don't know the context in which the, the the person who asked the question is is in, but oftentimes the faith-based organizations um, and provide um, fundings and some services, social services. Um, and in case of the U.S. big cities, uh, there are many churches, church-based organizations provide shelters and food banks and and diaper uh, banks, etc. So um, that comes to my mind. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much. Um, at this point, we don't have any more open questions. Um, so what I'm going to do, and someone did just ask about a recording of this session, and these sessions are recorded. These alumni panels are recorded. We'll follow up with everybody who attended this session um, with more information on um, with the website, our website, uh, more information on our program, and then also where you can find those recordings. But I wanna take a moment now to say thank you so much to our panelists for joining us today. We are um, so happy to get a chance to see alumni again and hear more about your work. And we really appreciate the time you took to be with us today. I also wanna say thank you to the, all the participants for taking time to join us today. Again, our next panel will be on January 20th. At, it'll be at 10 a.m. Eastern and that'll be on the COVID-19 response. And until then, we wish everyone um, wonderful uh, holidays, whichever you're celebrating and uh, a great start to 2023. <laughs>